Howdy, it's your boy, it's the Idget Reader, Quentin, it is Idget Reads and Rambles, and I'm here talking about a book that I just really enjoy. Um, I did a video a while ago that I'm not going to upload about my favorite novels, and this came in at number five. Um, but upon doing the video, it was a 20-minute video with my intro, my rambling intro and my uh, outro kind of thing, this wound up taking 12 minutes up of that 20. So I figured upon reflection and revisiting some passages of it, I think maybe it deserves a little higher in that list. It might be top three, I think. Top three or top two, maybe. I mean, I'd have to reread all of them, of course. But uh, yeah, I this thing has to go a lot higher and I got to do this thing a video of its own since it ate up so much of that discussion. It's been a while since I read it, but of course I'm talking about The Recognitions by William Gaddis. It is uh, a sort of scathing comic satire of American fakery. Topic ripe for satire. Um, I think it, it includes a lot more than American fakery, although America seems to be the sort of ground zero for the type of fakery uh, Gaddis was uh, exploring in this. But uh, it's been a while since I read it, so this is not going to be an analysis video. Analysis uh, of this is uh, notoriously <laughs> mishandled, <laughs> but... Um, yeah, it's just going to be me telling you to read the recognitions and telling you about what sort of what the book is like and sort of the pleasures of the book. It's not really for the person that has read the recognitions two, three times. Um, alrighty, so I'll just start with the, uh, the strengths of this book. And first and foremost is definitely the satire. Uh, it is just searing at points. I love that, uh, sometimes it's incredibly lighthearted, but other times it really communicates a severe hatred for the uh the sort of uh the subjects that are satirized and it lands on so many things american fakery is uh he fights the battle on many fronts but my favorite in tiny instance of satire uh and also a ton of black humor my favorite tiny instance is this radio program called uh laughing lazarus where we have the the title character laughing lazarus comes in and it's a sort of uh ad for a sleeping pill um <laughs> And this ad, this Laughing Lazarus character, speaks to the children. And the children love this radio program. The, the company is trying to sell these sleeping pills to parents through the kids. It's kind of crazy, and it's kind of sharp. Uh, so you have this Laughing Lazarus character comes on and basically says, Oh, wow, tell mommy to buy these pills. They're so delicious. They're flavored. And not only are they flavored, but they, they, they're like wafers. And, you know, kids love wafers. So <laughs> the kids badger the parents to get these. And that's a great piece of satire. But the sharpness of it really extends to the, the, the idea that not only will they sell you the sleeping pill, but they'll sell you the caffeine pill to wake you up. How funny is that? It, it's really good. I, I definitely enjoy the satire in this book, but there are times uh, where it's it's almost overshadowed by the sense of, of dread and like hopelessness of the book. I'm thinking specifically of the Pivner satire, as well as the, uh, yeah, when Pivner and Otto meet up, it's really uh, just kind of tough to swallow how sad that satire is. But there are points in it where I was just shrieking with laughter, which... The, the shrieking with laughter happens uh, probably, I want to say I, I shrieked about six, seven times reading this. Um, yeah. Uh, next strength of the book that I want to talk about is the characters. Um, I'm going to talk about Gaddis' uh, character voicing later, but just know that the character voicing and dialogue is a top tier in this book. Very uh, it, it just intellectually stimulating to read. But the characters in this book are all good, I think. Um, of course, they are very petty in a lot of spots, but... Overall, I think it's really interesting that Gaddis is able to have, like I say, 15, 20 uh, complex characters that right now it's been almost a Has it been a year? I think it's been over a year since I read this. I read this last spring, but uh, the, the spring before last. But uh, yeah, I can tell you all about so many characters in here. Um, uh, Esther is a really good character, more complex than most people would give her credit for. Uh, Wyatt, Stanley, Anselm. I love Anselm's character. Uh, I can tell you all about Agnes and uh, oh, it's, it's Sinister, yeah, Sinistera, Recto Brown, um, Basil Valentine. There's, this book is just loaded with good characters and uh, it's really fun to see them sort of uh, 
on the page just react to each other. And Gaddis's talents as a novelist uh, really, he has quite traditional talents as a novelist. He packs really uh, sort of defined and traditional character arcs into this book. So it's not all uh, postmodern experimental, you know, stuff that you might often hear when you, people talk about this book. It's very much not a postmodern novel. Um, it's very much not experimental. There are like two sort of scenes that I enjoyed that are experimental. And I might as well talk about them next. The sort of ballsy but practical scene ideas. There's a good section. I think it's like page 101. I've read it countless times. And it is a sort of short five-page collage of city life. Uh, that's really interesting. So what hap well, how he does this is he says, oh, on First Avenue, there's someone doing this. On Third Avenue, there's someone doing this. On Fifth Avenue, someone is on the phone and they just finished dialing a call. And then, you know, three pages later, the person on the other end of the call picks up what's going on, you know? There's a lot of stuff going on there. Uh, you know, you one of the one of the things is there's a... A conversation in a bar, you know, Merry Christmas, the man threatened, uh, where Santa Claus is in a bar. And then you have, uh, you know, you get the view from under a car and four feet are approaching the car from, you see, you see it from the bottom, right? Uh, that's really interesting. I love that scene idea. But this is another sort of, uh, that's not, that doesn't happen very often in the book. That is kind of, uh, actually, it's reminiscent of like Renata Adler in some ways, but Gaddis actually spends time navigating the scenes that the collage portrays, right? Um, so, uh, what else? The other scene idea I love, although I'm sure this is probably the greatest difficulty of the book, these artist parties, which I think are just ripe for satire. They're a blast to read. Um, <laughs> okay, so this scene idea, imagine I'm invited to the party, you know, you, you know me, I'm a really cool guy, I get invited to the party all the time. You stay at home, unfortunately, but you give me a microphone to take to the party, and you've met maybe, I want to say, 10 out of the 20 people at the party, it's not a very big party, uh, and you give me the microphone, I carry a microphone on me all night from the party. I start out in the kitchen, I go to the basement, I go to, um the hallway and I talk to people in the hallway, I might go to the washroom and then I come out and I might linger by the door for 10 minutes before I leave and then I give you the microphone, right? It's very unattributed dialogue, but you know some of the people there. So when I give you the microphone, you listen and there are a lot of people who you recognize what they're saying and you're like, oh, okay, that must be, uh, that must be uh, Wyatt, you know? And then there are other people that you would recognize and even people uh, you'd hear people's voices who you don't know, but you would recognize when that voice comes in based on the way that they speak and the perspective that they're putting forth, right? So what ends up happening is a lot of conversations are, you know, just kind of whizzing by. You know, Gaddis, it, it's going to be more radical in his book that I'm going to read next summer when I'm done uh, my first year, or my second year. Uh, J.R., I really want to get to this. It's going to be more radical in there, the unattributed dialogue. In this one, Gaddis might tell you, the lady in blue said, blah, 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 blah. Or there was a girl who came upstairs during the party to look for pills. And you get what she's talking about, right? Uh, but it's dramatic dial dialogue. A lot of the action is, is, is articulated through the dialogue. That's how you know stuff is going on. But all this unattributed dialogue, he's really good at um, not only giving these sort of almost like entropic... Uh, um, conversations, a sense of shape, right? And one will whiz into focus and another will recede from focus as this sort of narrative voice is going around the party. And he's great at giving all of these straight conversations, uh, conversations a sense of shape where the chapters do begin in one place, progress through a, a reflection that is basically, it, it's very T.S. Eliot. This book is very T.S. Eliot. Uh, but it's a sort of like a, polyphonic movement, you know, ideas discussed just based on theme. Uh, and each of these artist parties starts in one place, progresses, ends in a very different place, concluding the reflection. And it's really interesting, a lot of what he's able to pull off here with the character voicing. Not only do we know all the characters, but all of them are distinct based on their speech quirks and also based on um, their perspective, right? Um, so it's really interesting and not, and sorry, he does this with characters we know and we've met in the book, but we also get people who are just at that one party and most of the time they're used for satire 
And this is just amazing to read. There's a hilarious part in the first artist party where you get a, a character right off the bat. He's talking to someone. He's like, and he says, um, do you think I'm more of a negative positivist or a positive negativist? He's an artist, right? And, you know, we don't get the answer. But then once throughout this, the chapter, you get someone, uh, and when he's talking to someone, he says, I, I, he says, I think I'm a, I'm a negative positivist. And then as the chapter progresses, we get two girls talking towards the end and they say oh have you heard of this artist he, he's a really interesting artist he told me he was a negative positivist and the other one goes really he told me he was a positive negativist <laughs> it's really funny like it's the thing about this book is that it's it's just hilarious i think uh, i love it um <laughs> it's really quite uh, quite funny quite sharp satire all the time um, I've already talked about the dialogue, a lot of the dialect, the unattributed dialogue. It's really interesting. But keep in mind that if that sounds really difficult, most of this book is not that. Um, yeah. But that's what makes what, what makes this book difficult. It'll be the occasional sort of collage, the city collage. Although one thing I'll note about that is that sometimes you get dialogue that you can't distinguish who's speaking. And it doesn't matter who is speaking. It just matters that... It is not the person who was talking previously. It, tough to explain, but it, that's the thing. is When you need to know who's speaking, Gaddis will make sure you know who's speaking. And if you could just pay attention and catch on, because uh, he's, he, you're in good hands here. You're in really good hands. Uh, you'll, find, you'll find out. But yeah, what makes this uh, sort of difficult is the sheer amount of characters, uh, the sheer amount of arcs to keep track of. Uh, Wyatt uh, loses his own identity because he's not being true to who he is, which is a key part of the reflection here. Um, so he's referred to only by general pronouns, but it is his speech quirks are sort of um, distinct enough that you know when he's in the scene, and you know based on people's descriptions of him when he's in the scene. Uh, you know that uh, they're not those artist parties are not a huge part of the book. They probably take up um, less than two hundred pages, I think, uh, unless I'm misremembering. They take up less than 200 of these pages. Uh, yeah. There's just a lot of characters to keep track of. There's unattributed dialogue. Those co sort of collage scene ideas are very few. There are not a lot of them, but they are interesting when they pop up. And the thing that I believe will make this difficult as well, apart from the narration and, you know, there are long flowing poetic sentences that are just gorgeous to read. I didn't find them difficult. When I read a sentence, it was because it was so beautiful. I needed to read it twice. Uh, but... What makes this difficult is that the way theme is explored, there's a very interesting method of arriving at theme in this, where it's very, uh, the process of it is sort of, how, how he explores theme is sort of, it, it's a key process that he wants American society to have, right? Through recognition, through recursion. So we might get a, a, a song that Aunt May sings where it's a man of double deed who sowed his field without a seed, right? And you get that right in the opening part, but Gaddis plants the seed of that. And when he returns to it, we will get the story of a priest who uh, sows his field without a seed, which if you read the book, you know what that means. And then later on, uh, way towards the end, we get a character who quote unquote sows his field without a seed, which is, um, oh, we well, you know what that means, it's bananas. But um, that way of exploring theme, sort of, uh, if you're not prepared for it, it can be kind of difficult, right? Uh, but that that way of exploring theme also really affords some humorous passages. Uh, one of the funniest passages in the book happens really late. It's uh, after Re Reverend Guion's arc is completed, and we get... Um, <laughs> His arc is completed, and we get a scene of people eating bread in a monastery in Spain, I believe. Dear Lord, is is that ever a... Just thinking of that scene, is it's a lot, but it's one of the funniest passages in here. And it's also, you know, the, the theme of the book is about rec recursion, recognition. We recognize what the bread is. The characters do not. Nobody, everyone's losing their glasses. Uh, nobody's recognizing anything. The goddess is calling on you to recognize stuff, right? Um, and that that scene is hilarious. Just the whole way, the way he lays the foundation for that scene is just expertly done, and it's really funny. Um, 
The next thing I'll talk about is the insight and its scope. Uh, it provides some really awesome food for thought. Of course, it is a moral insight in a lot of instances, but I find it actually really tough to argue with uh, Gaddis's, with many of Gaddis's moral, uh, what do you call it? Like his, his sort of uh, moralizing in many spots. In some of it, I do question it, but uh, a lot of the morals of this book are really sort of pure. You know, he's talking about the way pills are prescribed, uh, advertising, what well, he's talking about being authentic to you, you know, not being original. All the artists are worried about being original. Uh, he's not worried about being original. This is not an original book, not at all, but it is completely Gaddis. And that is the commentary being made. Uh, but for now, I'm going to talk about the way that uh, the inside of this book and its scope are really interesting because the way he, uh, it's about American fakery, but the way that Gaddis maps American fakery onto so many elements of society and gets at some really just like key sort of ideas behind, I think sort of all of uh, Western civilization, you know, authenticity, uh, all that stuff is really interesting. He will map American fakery onto uh, art. And then we have a character who will basically say the devil is the father of false art. And we have these parallels being drawn between false art and false living. You know, people worship false gods. They have uh, false ideals, false practices in business, in love, in friendship, in faith. Uh, we have originality as a false pursuit because it excuses uh, poor craftsmanship, right? Uh, originality is uh, a word that, you know, untalented people uh, used to prop up untalented people by defending themselves against talented people because, you know, th they can't um, they can't do a thing the right way, so they have to do it their way, right? Yeah, it's really interesting. And uh, I think that a lot of the commentary of the book, there's a metafiction here that is basically asking you to uh, assess the recognitions based on uh, the values that it projects, you know? And that is not one of uh, originality. It is not one of originality. It is one of authenticity, right? It's not about... A lot of these artist types, they want to be original. They want to stand out. And they want to, you know, the guy with the clock around his neck. Kind of like Flava Flav. He, has a, he walks around the parties with a clock, you know. Think of Proof Rock. It's time. But he wants to be original. You know what I mean? But he's not him. You know, Wyatt has to be him. You know, and him isn't... Uh, a forgery. It's not. A, it's not copying the old masters. It's being him, but being him is not something original either, right? So it, it's a really interesting sort of commentary going on in this book. And again, that is sort of uh, there's commentary on everything going on in this book. It's not a postmodern book. It's very modernist. Again, a lot of uh, the use of uh, sort of polyphonic discussions, very T.S. Eliot, the way a lot of chapters will have uh, epigraphs or epigrams, whatever it is, that open chapters, uh, really good stuff. I love the one that follow that precedes the artist party where it says, and now the uh, nature of existence will be discussed at length from uh, The Origin of Species. Uh, I love the Confessions of an English Opium Eater one and the way that relates to the chapter. Um, I love so much of this. It's really interesting. And keep in mind that a lot of this book Gallant, or, sorry, not Gallant. <laughs> Gaddis's talents for, or as a novelist, actually are really traditional ones. You know, when you sit down and read a novel, you want a good character arc, unless you're reading postmodernism, which this is not, again, it's not postmodern. But you want a good character arc. Gaddis will give you 20. You know, you want a good plot. This thing is all plot. You know what I mean? It's just, there's so much good, good stuff going on in here. And one thing I haven't talked to talked about up until now is the prose. So I'm just going to read some sentences from this because the prose is the main thing about this book because in, okay, I'm just going to read the sentences and talk about them. Then on the right, alarmingly close stood a volcano losing its quiet smoke against the green sky. It stood out of space in time, like a thing seen in memory, not to be touched or known in any way. It ignored him beauty which would admit no tampering to be lost in the horror of intimacy. With every effort of his eyes, it grew less real, more distant, as the airplane flew on, like a fragment of time itself, scrambling through eternity. Beautiful stuff. And that is like, in terms of the larger theme of the book, that's a footnote, man. That sentence is like a footnote in terms of the larger themes of the book. It's it's kind of insane with the regularity that Gaddis just throws out amazing prose, amazing similes the, uh, and metaphors. The moon and other lustrous blisters of heaven were gone. Oh, is it ever good? Um, here's another one. 
The sun sank over the sharp edge of the marble sea. The shout sounded again from above. Nevertheless, Fuller paused there at the rail for a moment, that momentary sense of something lost, that sudden moment of emptiness which pervades everywhere the instant the sun has disappeared. Like, wow! You know, it, it's just kind of insane how he can just throw this stuff out, throw this stuff out and not even, it's like he's not even trying, you know? Which that actually kind of sucks that JR is written the way it is because you know, apparently it's seven-eighths unattributed dialogue, which on one hand seems the perfect Gaddis book, but on the other hand, like, I love the prose and in, in, in the recognitions that it's cool that he kind of doubts what comes easily to him, but I, I just, the prose is some of the, it's, it might be the best prose I've ever read. I know that's heavy, but it might be, right? Um... Yeah, that's really what I got to say about this. And keep in mind that I didn't talk about so much stuff here. I didn't give you a plot summary. I didn't give you character sketches. I did not... Well, and I didn't... I, one thing I want to add is that not only are the uh, is the plot good and the characters good, but the arcs are great, but he's also giving you a killer thematic arc. And he likes to uh, portray a problem in a, in a book. I actually read it in one of the Paris Review interviews. I have those books... Uh, but he said he likes to present a problem and then solve the problem. And he does that. But, uh, oh yeah, and I forget the, uh, the epilogue. It, it, the uh, epilogue has a, I don't know, the, the quote that opens the epilogue is hilarious. It's from a brothel. But um, yeah, he's really interesting, very lewd, sense of humor at times, a lot of toilet humor in this. Uh, I really enjoy it. Uh, I'm also trying to track down the uh, Dalky Archive edition of this, because this is a nice edition, but I kind of, uh, I don't know, when I read this, I was annotating a lot of books in pencil. It was really messy, so I didn't really enjoy it. But, um, okay, what did I not tell you about? I didn't give you plot summary, didn't give you characters, uh, character sketches. I did not analyze the book thematically. I didn't uh, talk about Mithraism or the uh, connections to the Golden Bough. I didn't do anything. I, I, told, I gave you a whole lot of nothing in this video, but I hope to God it's a whole lot of nothing that will make you read this book because this thing is incredible. I'm thinking about it right now. I might not have ever read a, as good of a debut novel. I think this is top of the list for debut novels. And I think one of my two, three favorite books of all time. And it's not because I like the, my four favorite books all, of all time that were ahead of this. It's not because I think they're better novels. This was on there. I don't rec I don't really, um, relate to the thematic statement that heavily, but it's just so fucking well done. Everything in here is just so well done that it's, it kind of needed to be in there, you know, even though I don't have the sort of, uh, personal connection that I might have to a novel, like, so the wind won't blow it all away by Richard Brodigan or The Ice Palace by Tarje Vesas. But yeah, so Recognition's one of my favorite books ever. It needs to be talked about. Uh, other Gaddis books that I have, uh, I started out reading Gaddis with Carpenter's Gothic, which I, um, I'm i not sure I would recommend. Uh, but, you know, it, it is one of Gaddis's, it's his, it's his second shortest book. I want to find uh, Agape Agape, because, uh, but I want to find it after I read my next Ber uh, Bernhard novel because I think Bernhard is a prominent influence, but I have this. This is the only other Gaddis book I've read. And with me right here, I have, of course, A Frolic of His Own. Uh, this thing is... Uh, the... Oh, another talent he has. At this point, I'm just rambling. You know, I, what do I, you know, <laughs> I'm just gushing. But another talent he has is for interesting opening sentences. Justice. You get justice in the next world. In this world, you have the law. <laughs> yeah, this is a... a I'm sure it will be good. Uh, I still have to read JR, but again, uh, summer 2022, 2023, summer 2023, I'm getting at this. And recognitions, amazing opening sentence as well, or opening paragraph. Um, I don't want the introduction. Uh, of course, it uh, opens with a Faust thing. But the uh, first uh, two sentences. Um, even Camilla had enjoyed masquerades of the safe sort where the mask may be dropped at that critical moment it presumes itself as reality. Yeah. Uh, 
<laughs> the second sentence. But the procession up the foreign hill, bounded by cypress trees, impelled by the monotone chanting of the priests, and retarded by hesitations at the fourteenth at the fourteen stations of the cross, not to speak of the funeral carriage in which she was riding, a white horse-drawn vehicle which resembled a Baroque confectionery stand, a Baroque confectionery stand, <laughs> might have ruffled the shy countenance of her soul if it had been discernible. Right? You kind of have to read it to see what, where, the, where the parentheses lie. But um, great opening. Anyways, 25 minutes. I'm just gushing too much. I got to go. Uh, tell me, have you read Gaddis? Uh, what are some other, well, how good is, is Agape Agape? And, um, I don't know, let's just, let's get each other hyped on JR, uh, Frolic of His Own, Carpenter's Gothic, The Recognitions. Let's just enjoy Gaddis and appreciate Gaddis in the comments. Peace and groovy. Bye.